On cue. Oh, welcome. Whatever. Welcome. <laughs> you, know, you know what, Thomas? Don't ever feel bad worrying about technology in front of a technology guy. He's he's okay. <laughs> Okay. All, All right. right, we're hearing today from uh, Hunt Blair, uh, Director of Healthcare Reform at DIVA, uh, who is going to talk with us about the Health Information Technology Plan. Great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So my mission here today is to give you kind of a broad overview of the report that uh, came to you and to the uh, standing committees of the legislature on the 15th, actually the 17th, because the 15th was uh, Sunday of uh, January. And this is a report that was required in Section 10 of Act 48. And uh, what it asks the Secretary of Administration or designee to do is review the Health Information Technology Plan that's required by a different part of statute to ensure that the plan reflects creation of the Vermont Health Benefit Exchange, transition to a public-private universal health care system, and any necessary development or modifications to public health information technology um, and data to public health surveillance systems to ensure that there's progress towards full implementation of the big vision. So the secretary designated me as the state's HIT coordinator. As such, I've reviewed the plan and found that the state is indeed engaging in steps required to ensure full implementation of the state's health reform goals. So important just to clarify that this is a report about a plan and as I talked about the last time that I was before you all, I have a, a correction to one of the things that I said. So a report about a plan that we, prior to the passage of Act 48, um, have had combined the state requirements and federal requirements um, having to do with health information technology as, you know, defined prior to Act 48, so electronic health records, health information exchange, et cetera. And basically what happened with the Section 10 is it expanded the purview of the plan and of the division and of HIT in general to include uh, all of the systems that are represented on my infamous color, colorful chart. Um, I did not bring copies of today. Um, it's on my wall. Excellent. You know, I, I, I was just at CMS last week, and it's on the walls of a surprising number of people down there as well. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> what um, I have primarily addressed is what we're doing to focus on the, the new and expanded responsibilities. And what we will be doing is updating the entire state HIT plan to now reflect the state requirements which I believe in uh, 559 this year, there's going to be uh, um, a, a, in the process of moving H559 through the legislature this year, I believe there's going to be a suggestion to revise the requirements of the state HIT plan to reflect the information, the, the insurance exchange and the other systems that I was just referencing. Um, and so for timing and sanity's purpose, um, I'm going to continue to recommend that we just have one plan and that we only update it. The statute, it needs to be up updated from the state perspective as needed. From the Fed's perspective, it gets updated as they require having to do with their funding. Now, you may recall that when I was here last, um, the notion was that they uh, we expected like right before the end of the year to get a uh, um, policy information notice or pin from them with the directions on what's supposed to, on the new plan. It still hasn't come forward. Um, uh, I know because I had a conversation with folks at ONC last week that it hasn't even like moved out of ONC to, to OMB for clearance. So that's a couple of um, at least a few weeks away. And then we'll have 90 days or as a number of us have submitted uh, comments to ONC, we would prefer to have 120 days after they issue that in to provide them. And of course, um, one of the things that I'm going to talk about is that planning for all this is somewhat challenging because everything is happening in a very fluid and dynamic environment. And so an example now switching from information exchange to insurance exchange, um, 
Last Friday at 5.27 p.m., the feds posted on their um, website, uh, private for uh, insurance exchange grantees website, um, detailed business architecture for the exchange. Um, so what the um, uh, plan management function functionality should be like pages and pages and pages of Visio documents, basically. That's all the like actual um, data flow diagrams as opposed <coughs> to my cartoon data flow diagram. Um, so that's last Friday, <laughs> um, something that had been anticipated to come months earlier. And the good news is, um, in terms of our own um, uh, planning and implementation work, that you know, if we had guessed and guessed incorrectly, <laughs> we would have invested a lot of um, you know uh, um, effort on in a direction that might not necessarily have been consistent with the federal uh, infrastructure. So, the one of the overall strategies that we're taking in in um, moving forward with implementation of all these new systems is what's called an agile development, an agile, agile project management approach. So in contrast to a waterfall approach. So a waterfall is, you know, you do things one through 25, write out the requirements, you get a vendor in, you know, all the way through, they get to the end and they start testing to see if it all works. Um, a good example of challenges in that approach is just across the river in New Hampshire where they are in year six of their development of their new uh, Medicaid management information system. Um, so an, an agile approach in contrast is like lots of little sprints and scrums. So you do a little bit of work. It's, it's very much like the PDSA <coughs> cycle um, that we're using in the blueprint for rapid cycle improvement. So. Um, that's uh, pretty much a requirement of the environment that we're, we're working in, but what comes along with that, and I had lots of conversations <coughs> with Commissioner Larson about this, because it's a little anxiety producing, because you can't say with a kind of a, the, the kind of assurance, or I would really say false assurance, that you get from a detailed project plan and a waterfall design. It's like, okay, so here we are, we're here, and we know this is happening, and it's, it's much more fluid. Um, however, I, it's basically the only way to operate um, in this environment, and um, I'll talk about some of the um, uh, various risks and risk mitigation strategies um, associated with that. So um, just as a reminder, I, I know this is something that, that you all um, are, are well aware of, but I think it's, it's just important to keep restating because is my new rule is that until, until people say, no, 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 you've said it enough, I get it. I'm just going to keep repeating things because I've found that, you know, in trying to be polite <laughs> and not be too, uh, people don't necessarily get it. So, so you're forewarned. Tell me to shut up when you're ready to have me stop repeating things. Um, so our entire, uh, what we're calling the, from everything that's on that picture, is the health services enterprise portfolio. And the entire health services enterprise portfolio is being designed, procured, adapted, and upgraded in order to meet both the current and the near and current and near term needs and to ensure that over the coming years all of those enterprise components will function in a way to support our envisioned public private universal um, healthcare system. So, <clears throat> as such, the portfolio represents not just building the exchange or procuring a new MMIS or expanding HIT, it really is this vision of a neural network for our healthcare system so that we can manage it and operate it as a system. Um, so it's really, it's foundational to um, how we are going to manage um, healthcare and you know, you want to be able to have global budgets, we don't have the data coming in, et cetera, et cetera, we understand that. Um, I think an, an important thing, however, to, to realize that, kind of going to my <laughs> earlier statement about an agile approach, is that we've got lots of competing priorities, you know, time deadlines, like we want to get the exchange stood up by the 2013-2014 deadlines or there will be, you know, substantial problems with that. <laughs> so um, 
So we have to pick very carefully which components of this big integrated Lego set we're going to move forward on first and second and third um, so that we hit the deadlines in, in the right order. So a lot of what um, I spend my days doing is addressing that problem. And, and we have basically, you know, three key strategies that um, we use uh, to, to achieve that. The first, and, and um, you hear this over and over again, is a real cross-boundary or interdisciplinary, interdepartmental, interagency collaborative approach. Collaboration across domains is essential. You have to have extremely careful phasing of the project components and prioritization and reprioritization and reprioritization because of how things will develop. Um, <clears throat> and I really have to make um, hard choices along the way. Some of the, some of the prioritization people aren't going to like. And I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. Right now, moving through the legislature, there's a bill S89, which um, has really admirable uh, um, goals, which is to establish a new Medicaid benefit for working adults, uh, disabled working adults. Um, <clears throat> a lot of time has been put in um, on that uh, development of that, Dale staff and others. However, to implement that new Medicaid benefit on the time frame that's contemplated in S89 would mean that we'd be building in that new eligibility and enrollment function in our old system, our old access system that we're about to scrap. So the recommendation that I've made to um, both Commissioner Larson and to actually to Secretaries Racine and Spalding is that we just have to call a timeout. We should add no new health benefit programs that have to be put into this old system because what we really need to be doing is building the new eligibility system, what we call VIEWS, Vermont Interactive Eligibility Workflow System, VIEWS, and uh, which is really you can think of as, as being kind of one project with the exchange itself, because of course eligibility and enrollment is the key function of the exchange. So I'm going to move healthcare benefits into v and e eligibility and enrollment into VIEWS. We're actually going to start taking healthcare benefits out of the old access system and moving them in. That whole just managing that transition in the uh, very short time period that we have left. To do that. That that's the kind of prioritization we're going to have to do because otherwise we're we're at risk for meeting our goals. The other uh, sort of um, framing thing that uh, I think is worth is worth talking about is there are really three different domains of work that have to be orchestrated. There's health reform policies, which you know, include state, state policies, the work that you all are doing, federal policies. There are health services, business operations, program operations. That's a, a, a second area. And then there's the IT, health services IT, and then really all the rest of the agency IT, because it's not uh, agency of human services IT, because it's not like the health services IT is really in isolation, it's, it's uh, you know, very much interconnected with everything. And so I take as my responsibility in the Division of Health Reform's responsibility to sort of be at the center of the, the overlapping Venn diagram of those three areas of policy, program, and IT, and ensuring that there's, again, this cross-boundary communication, you know, very clearly moving things forward. So um, one of the things that uh, Angela Rell, the agency, um, HS uh, CIO and I've recommended is that we need a steering committee to oversee all of these things and when the question came up well so who's on that steering committee um, pointed to the secretary and to the <laughs> CIO the state CIO Richard Bose and like you all like you all have to be engaged in this and move the make because they're going to be like it it's I know everybody likes to say, you know, we'll just have IT do it, <laughs> but that's, you know, that way is, lies peril. So we're, um, so anyway, that's just an important kind of uh, uh, framing approach and actually, you know, really part of our risk mitigation strategy. So what is the status of views? So um, 
I'll answer in what is the status of the overall enterprise. So on the 4th of January, we issued our first RFP um, in a series of health service enterprise RFPs. And um, it's actually a good story to tell about that because the one of the challenges of doing this Lego building block approach is that um, you're going to be doing a lot of RFPs and moving a lot of contracts through. And of course, historically, that has not been necessarily a particularly accelerated process in the state environment. And so um, working with our um, uh, consultants, Action Mill, and working on process redesign, which is really one of the, that's, that's part of our agile strategy also. I mean, we can't do different, we can't do the same old thing and expect different results, right? So we're doing everything differently. So we uh, typically, uh, an RFP would, would take weeks to go from initial identification of need to drafting it to getting out the door. We got everyone that uh, was a stakeholder in some way around this first, the first RFP, which was for the Enterprise Master Person Index, the EMPI, um, <clears throat> which will be the central you know, authoritative source of record of everybody, again, to respond to Khan's now couple of decade old quest for an unduplicated count. Um, and you know, not by accident that that's the first one, right? It's totally foundational. Um, we don't have that one working right in these agile scrums. We're really going to be <laughs> in trouble. So uh, we got everybody in the room, including not just state staff and not just IT staff, but the business folks. We had people from Vital there. We had people from the health department because one of the things that is essential is that we're going to be using this whole enterprise, for instance, for immunization registry uh, information to move from EHRs to the exchange <coughs> to the health department. So. Um, at the end of 48 hours, two days of everybody in a room together, we completed the RFP and sent it on to routing for approval. And had it not been the week before Christmas, it would have been posted in the last week of the new year. But we didn't make everybody work through the Christmas uh, and New Year's holidays. So it, uh, January 4th is when we got it posted. And that is precisely, and that's due on the 9th of February, so next week. Um, we've already had our, um, you know, uh, bidders questions and, and, and uh, um, that's uh, moving forward. And what we uh, also did um, recently, and uh, I think maybe you all saw the, the in our, our uh, the first edition of our newsletter, which we've already renamed uh, Currents, um, but was like the, <laughs> the weekend healthcare uh, uh, IT. A uh, picture of uh, the, the, one of the big wall in uh, Diva filled with sticky notes, and that is the life, the the um, project life cycle from identifying a need all the way through identifying the federal funding sources, working with the feds on that, doing the RFP, doing the contracting, implementing the contracting, and then you know rinse and repeat, starting all over again. Um, it's a really large and cumbersome process, and one of the biggest risk factors in all of this really has to do with um, the state getting in the state's own way to achieve this. Now, I would be, um, so well, I'll finish the story about the, the big picture. Is, so what we're doing is rigorously going through that with various stakeholders and, and saying, well, where are things that we can you know, take out of this or streamline it? We're again engaging, you know, uh, Jim Giffen from uh, uh, Agency Central Business Office and you know our business office and then uh, uh, AAGs, like everybody who has anything to do with all of this stuff moving or stopping through the process. I'll give you an example. Uh, recently, not one of my contracts, but one that uh, came through Diva where it got handed over, it had gone almost all the way through the routing process and was it very near the end and the response when it got hand delivered to them was, well, no, we need 10 days for this. You're only giving us eight days. And I had a couple of different responses to that. One, one is, why do you even need eight hours? Like this has already been reviewed by a whole bunch of people. And, you know, and not to say that, that your signature on this is a formality, but nonetheless, it's, you know, what exactly do you need eight or ten days to do? Um, so, uh, what so you've been through all that with Master Person Index. 
And what comes next? So what comes next is either <laughs> the uh, master provider directory, um, which we think that, that it was in the report, you read the report, that's what's coming next. What we have determined is that it probably makes more sense to have the portal come next because the portal is going to, um, we wouldn't, we, well, the portal will be the way into the provider directory um, and this makes sense to, anyway, sequencing issue. Um, so, and the views will come very shortly after that in uh, some components. Uh, the, the, the question that we have at each step of the way is, again, weighing this, is it better to take a little piece and move that forward, or is this little piece for the insurance exchange actually exactly what we need to re-procure for the MMIS for, for Medicaid? Like program integrity functions, for instance. Like, okay, well, the, we were the, required through the exchange uh, legislation to have program integrity functions. We, of course, have that um, at Medicaid. So, it's like, can we combine those? To what extent do we combine them? Do we, you know, all the, you're getting the, you're getting my point there, so all that. So, um, the, uh, that's the high level view of what we're doing. And what I will say is that we're getting lots of good cooperation from folks. Um, uh, the, um, one of our solutions to that, you know, eight days or 10 days problem is to have everybody on the signature route get on a phone call together the same day and say, basically, speak now or forever hold your peace, and then we're going to walk it around and get the, you know, get it signed. Um, and there's agreement that that's that's what needs to happen to make this to make this work. So there's a lot of I mean I think that the you know the lesson of Irene the, the famous bridge that would take four you know uh, normally take uh, two years that was put up in four weeks um, is instructive to everybody um, that hired at the cells. Well, and it, it's possible <laughs> it's possible to Just do to things more <laughs> rapidly. Yeah. Right. So um, it just scares me that nobody knew that before. <laughs> I mean, about I mean, the bridge? No, I just mean, do you, do you really think that there are people who can do stuff fast if you just leave them alone? I mean, oh no, absolutely. I mean, no, absolutely. It's the, the having having it's only been inside. The, it's shocking to me that anybody thinks that that all the regulation and all the and all the other things it takes to put a road in are actually helping anything. You know what I mean? It's when you need the road fixed. Right, right. And no, it's, I, I under, it's understand. It's the opposite that is true. Right. Well, I think that, you know, the nature of the government process is to mitigate risk at every step, right? And um, I think to we're balancing, right? exactly. And so we're balancing the uh, risk and cost benefit um, in that equation. Yeah. So, um, I wanted to, uh, I'm not like, going to read through this whole report, it's actually God, pretty short, um, and you all, and, uh, but I would, I would recommend that, that you do read it yourselves, um, and like I said, I'll be back next week, so if there are specific questions that come up, then I'd be happy to address those, and what I will be coming back with next week is um, the next in a very colorful um, uh, printout that's actually timelines, and I'll say right now that there are timelines that are you know, our best understanding of what they are, you know, currently. And I'm pretty sure that the version of it that's printed out right now in my backpack or sitting here on the computer will not be the one that I bring you next week. Um, you no, know, I would appreciate, though, if you would quickly hit each of these highlights on the second page. Sure. Just to bring them to life a little bit. Sure. The, the starting with the Just recent kidding. activities include? Yes. Okay. So, um, completion, federal it's approval, it's, it's a three. third page. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, federal approval of the state Medicaid HIT plan. So, what that means is that to get the 9010 funding, um, okay. right, you got it. that one. You got it. And we got it. And that was uh, when? That was actually, I'm sorry that everything has a complicated answer. It's the plan was approved in August. There's also oh well, it's the next line. Um, is the no? It isn't the next line. So anyway, the there's approving the plan, and then there's getting the IAPD, the Implementation Advanced Planning Document, approved. That got split in two. The first part of it got approved in October. 
Um, we are the next part is pending approval any day now. It's okay. just on the phone. Okay. But but the but we have started. Um, well, that's that. Yeah, does this to, happen to, once or every year? The SMHP gets updated on an annual or as needed basis um, because of the. The SMHP and the, and, the, and the federal ONC, the Office of National Coordinator, IT plan requirements, I mean, they're very tightly inter, interconnected. Okay. So Medicaid is, is indicating that, given that we're doing the ONC update, at least us states that are all together, um, that we might not have to update the SMHP. Okay. Right. We're, that's, we're keeping okay. our fingers crossed on that. Um, so uh, um, funding authority to support all the planning work from the um, folks who are working on this. Uh, that's the second bullet. We launched the Electronic Health Record Incentive Program in October. This is the 100% money. This is really why we get the 90-10 under the first bullet, is to, to run this program um, and do a bunch of other stuff. And as I've, have, I think, talked to you all about before, mm -hmm. we've leveraged that about as far as we can, um, you know, in uh, Vermont's historic fashion of getting good value out of uh, Medicaid uh, matches. And so we'll actually be getting um, Medicaid dollars to help support the ongoing cost of operating the, the exchange, the vital wow. exchange. Okay. Next one, um, it's just the, the dollar details of the EHR incentive program, um, 5.7 million in December. They're a position um, uh, will help us with it at the moment. There's one person <laughs> managing all this. Uh, um, in his abundant spare time, it's Terry Beckett, the Associate State HIT Coordinator. Where we actually have the positions uh, to support that um, are in recruitment right now. Okay. Uh, we continue to participate in the NESI's uh, Insurance Exchange in Early Innovator Grant. I will say that it's kind of an open question about the the how deeply. Um, connected we're going to be. Um, I started to get really worried last fall as it was taking them longer and longer and longer to work through the, um, the, the complex environment that they created for themselves by having the connector as one entity, the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, and UMass, which is actually the recipient of that SIO grant and, as you know, does a lot of policy work for Mass Medicaid. Those three entities and all of their lawyers sent uh, the, their RFP for their whole exchange enterprise went through almost 50 iterations. And it was months behind going out the door. And um, you know, we, one of the things, I'm sure I talked about this the last time I was here, we've been thinking about is, well, how much of that can we reuse? But we're going to have to make decisions before Exactly. Which is, however, one of the things we can do, and we're so allowed to do. Massachusetts gets to use the entire grant. Yeah, that would. Um, I mean, there might be parts that we can that we can take. Um, we will be able to take the a, any artifact they produced, including this big old RFP. Like we'll cut and paste whole chunks of it into our RFPs because it's all that's it's very applicable. And and that's you know okay. not stealing. It's what's actually expected under the under the grant. Um, I already addressed the next one, the redesign, redesign yep. of the procurement strategy. So on the next page, um, just that we've started um, having some success with that. Uh, we, uh, second bullet down, uh, awarded a $100,000 planning grant to the Vermont Council of Mental Health Services. Actually, I just got the report from that today. I haven't had a chance to read it but in my inbox. Um, and we're doing similar grants with uh, the um, uh, home health and long-term care providers. Also, um, have uh, um, just yesterday um, uh, got a contract uh, completed for uh, services of a physician who's uh, a nursing home uh, medical director who's going to be doing consulting work with us on because the, the nursing home uh, association probably I mean, nursing home industry is probably the furthest behind in the development of IT. And um, it's actually it's kind of a great story. She came to us, Dr. Martha Steitelman, and said, this is not working for me. Like, I'm sitting here across the parking lot from a hospital, and they have information I'm not getting. And it just like, and like, great. Would you like to come help solve that problem? So it's very exciting. Um, this 
administrative. Yeah, so this is just sort of more of the same, uh, um, more administrative simplification. Um, is there a document on that plan around? There is. The, the, it Could I is part of, it's one of, um, it's Robin's big report, the giant integration report. There's an administrative simplification section, which um, I can get to you. Would you? Yeah, That'd absolutely. be great. Thank you. I might, it's, it's, I might only have a PDF, in which case I'll send you the whole thing and okay. tell you which, <laughs> where to turn. Now, what we did um, just hire, or we we're in the process of finalizing contract for um, further work on that, on the administrative simplification. So I, um, I don't think I can yet send you the scope of that work, but, but I'll follow up on that also because I think it will be of interest Thank to you. you. Um, we're, we're excited about that, and I will talk more about that in a second. Um, as you know, we got our um, 10 million uh, mm -hmm. of IT funds, 18 million total. Um, we just had our first gate review with SIA last Monday. Um, uh, the way that they had originally structured these were a series of reviews on IT and then a less formal process on the, on the other 8 million, or the, the non-IT um, functions. What they realized is that kind of going along with my point about the, the Venn diagram and the three different areas, that they were starting to see problems where there was work going on in the IT sphere that was really not uh, as linked as it could and should have been with the other parts. And so they are redesigning their review process to have, um, have it be fully integrated. And so we were kind of a beta test for them on that and um, uh, were uh, actually, I really applaud their, that change on their on their part, I think it, um, it it reflects our own experience of needing to have these things, you know, to closely. Um, and and we passed the gate review, so we move forward. Um, we have uh, almost. This has changed since the report. Also, we've almost uh, completed uh, new. Uh, con privacy consent standards uh, for information exchange. Um, there are a couple of wrinkles that have uh, um, arisen since we thought we were done um, that uh, have to do with um, technology issues that are have to be reflected in law, you know, in a way that, that just hadn't, was like a sort of a, something that had not been caught um, earlier by vitals attorneys. Um, and so, um, as long as I'm on that point, um, this also goes to the correction that I wanted to make um, from my uh, previous testimony. In one section of Act 48, it talks about you all reviewing, um, and um, in another section, it actually does talk about you all approving the plan. So. Um, my bad. I corrected me. I missed the. <laughs> perhaps you had missed. I should have corrected you when you first said it, but I wasn't that smart until I reread the law <laughs> right. and said, "Wait a second. All right. So you all will be approving this, and so the um, the consent policy because it's part, the, it's part of the state HIT plan. So we'll be bringing that to you for your approval. And the, the chain of that will be so we've had a privacy and security work group and, um, that helped me develop this. Um, and and we'll, about. Yeah. About, about when are you going to get it? Um, yeah. Not, not the next time that I'm back, but I would think the time after that. I like it. The, okay. It should be um, moving forward within, within the six next, months type thing. Uh, within six weeks, actually. Six weeks. It should, okay. But that's just the privacy months. and security. That's just the privacy and security. Part, right? Yeah. And yeah the whole plan, plan that's, will be later. that's okay. within six months. Um, the, um, so, what's going to happen is because of these changes, it's going to go back to the Privacy and Security Work Group, and then I'll make a recommendation to Secretary Larson. Secretary Larson will make a recommendation to, uh, excuse me, to Commissioner Larson. Mark will make a recommendation to Secretary Spaulding, and it'll come here to you all. So, um, so that's what's going to happen with that. And I already mentioned the last one, the first uh, health service. Thanks. So, um, the next thing that I just want to comment on, and this actually does tie to, uh, we've talked about this before, and, um, and it uh, <coughs> ties to the administrative simplification, is it's, 
you know, we're very fortunate at the moment in terms of the partnership and collaboration that we're having with our federal partners at CMS. It's really unprecedented. I mean, those of, those of us who have worked on Medicaid policy for more decades than we <laughs> care to admit know that historically CMS has kind of been the, you know, the gorilla and, you know, it says jump, you say how high, and that's kind of, there hasn't been exactly an interactive relationship with CMS. Um, but it's really, really changed in a, in a number of significant ways. And I think I had mentioned the, um, I think it was the meeting was coming up right uh, after I had, um, that's right, it was the, the next day. Anyway, we had a great, we had a great six hour session with them that, you know, just to remind you, they asked us to design, and it was a really good kind of workshop on um, their thinking and our thinking about identity management, which resulted in a small work group. Uh, Massachusetts uh, was also there um, that day, the 9th of December, and uh, Oregon was uh, there by phone. Formed this little work group. She had a tangible product by the next week, um, a uh, minimum data set uh, for uh, the, the, the smallest list possible of, of core data attributes um, for identity management. This is something that um, is essential for the insurance exchange to function. It's also something that's essential for health information exchange to function. And the federal process related to identity management for information exchange is through the Office of the National Coordinator, the ONC, over here. And it has been going on for a really long time, a couple of years now. We don't have standards. That they've been very, it's a very lugubrious process for them to issue standards. Um, fortunately, CMS, uh, they got, their deadlines are our deadlines. They can't wait, so they're moving forward. And what we found um, is that they're very anxious to leverage the infrastructure that they're building to the furthest extent possible, to the point that um, They've renamed the federal insurance hub, the federal data hub, and in having conversation with them, um, following up our meeting, and then actually just again last week, clarifying, um, going through with the with my picture, saying, okay, so we got the insurance exchange, and that's meeting up with the federal hub through our EMPI and our provider directory. And you're willing for us to use your federal service for that. We've also got the, the information exchange, not to mention other parts of state government that have identity management needs. Can we use the same in infrastructure for all of them? And it, like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that to them is perfect. So what that means is that we're going to, I mean, it will save us money and time. Um, and really more significantly, it means that um, we will have uh, an authoritative um, central repository of people's identities um, in uh, constructed in such a way that ultimately um, we ought to be able to automate a lot of processes that currently break down around typos generally. So um, uh, one of the things that Steve Capel is he um, started warming to the idea of what could be done with this. He said, wow, you could like completely do away with coordination of benefits. It would just all happen because there wouldn't be any question about, you know, you'd, you, if you really do have an ironclad identity management system, um, then that really is the underpinning of successful um, administrative simplification. So it's a big win um, moving this forward. So we're very excited about that. And um, uh, happily will be something that um, other states will benefit from as well. Um, although we are certainly poised to take, you know, full benefit of it as rapidly as possible. Um, it's been going on for a long time, so. So this health services enterprise is, you call it a neural network, which means that all of the, all of the information IT systems that currently are all over the Agency of Human Services now come together, correct? Ultimately, yes. Okay. And you have a master provider um, index, or so you have me, you have all, all of us in there connected so that you're linking that information to providers. That makes, that's part of the network. And, it be, and it's a repository, really, of information 
but getting back to how your nursing home medical director lamented, how does that deliver information in a real way to the provider? So, a couple of different ways. Because um, it's really, you know, we're talking about a, a not just a repository, but a network of networks of repositories, right? right. So, right. In, in, yep. the, in the case of the, the nursing home one is actually, in the scheme of things, relatively simple in that um, hospitals, and all hospitals in Vermont will have the capacity uh, to do this and it should all be turned on and working by June of this year, the end of June of this year, should be able to send um, demographic data, care summary data, discharge notes, et cetera, through the, um, in, through the beehive, through the information exchange that vital operates. So the hospitals do that, the Department of Health will be able to do that, everybody will be able to do that. Um, ultimately, everybody will be able to do it. I mean, it's happening sequentially. Yeah, okay. But hospitals are first. Hospitals are first. Okay. Hospitals and then all the doctor's offices that are part of the blueprint and then every one that you know, gets added on okay. after that. Um, so the big thing is being able to have the nursing homes have IT systems that can receive it. Because most nursing homes, like their IT systems are basically have to do with federal compliance. The, right. The wonderful right. MDS. MDS. It's all the MDS. The thousand of indicators in the MDS. Right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Now, one of the things that's kind of cool that's going on is that MDS is a minimum data set, right. yeah. which runs to thirty-seven pages now. That's yeah. the minimum, <laughs> and and it has to do, and it's about payment, really. It's right. documenting. Right. It's not not about care. It's not clinical no. care. And and every nursing home has in everywhere has at least one FTB who does nothing else but deal with this because you have to update the the MDS every. 30, 60, 90 days for Medicare and then And most of those are Medicaid patients. Exactly. In the nursing home. Okay. Right, right. So, so they've got all that IT that's not being particularly helpful. Um, I mean, it's helpful for getting paid, but, um, and for spotting gross errors. Yeah, there's some safety stuff. Yeah, exactly. There's a little bit. Of but, more than a little bit, but, but yeah, it's not, it's not what it was really designed for. Um, Nursing homes have uh, automated, you know, billing systems. But they there are only four nursing homes in the state that actually have electronic health record systems. So part of what we got to do is figure out, okay, well, are we going to expand the docsite infrastructure? What we're using for the blueprint, so that the nursing homes have that. They can they can look at the care summary there. I mean, that's sort of like the quickest. And that will be a, and that will be a, a goal of the health services enterprise is that kind of integration. Yeah, okay. Absolutely, absolutely. It's that's the that's why it's a, just a little um, daunting that. But you, I'll tell all. you, if, if every doctor and that I talk to, you know, if if we could give them access to each other's information system, I mean, that, that we could almost convince them to do anything else. It's that important. Right. It's really that important. Right. Right. No, in I terms of duplication, in terms of quality of care, it is that important. Right, absolutely. No, I, I, I agree. No, that's, that's very much. Uh, um, so it can't just be a repository. It's got to be a deliverer of, of a meaningful and interpretable information. Right, yeah. right. absolutely. No, that's. Like I'm just wondering, it's like October of 2013, and citizens are going to have to log on to a computer and sign up for health care. Or call a, or call a help desk, the service desk, or do it, it has to be under ACA, online, yeah. print, and phone. <clears throat> we going to be ready? We are going to be ready. We are going to be ready. That's the. I mean, that's part of how we passed the gate review last week. I mean, it's. Uh, is it, it going to be? You a, don't have to say any more than that. Okay. No, I mean, because I mean, the point is that if somebody asked me, I would say I don't know, because I don't know if it's knowable. There's a lot. There's a lot that has to come together. This isn't right. just a state. It's not just one thing. It's a lot of things. Well, and that's that's part of how it's going to be ready. I mean, this is actually one of my so the like the time frames in this are horrible, right? They're actually insane. But it's not really. I mean, it's extremely daunting to do any big IT project and do it in these time frames. It's crazy. Right. So we have a couple of things going for us. One thing, the United States federal government also has the same timelines and is doing the same thing for those states that aren't doing it on their own. 
all the states have to have their side of components hooking up to all this, even the ones that are having the feds do the insurance exchange, their Medicaid eligibility systems all have to tie together. So we have this, you know, giant national effort that's happening um, together. And so, I mean, the feds are actually doing it. They have to. Yeah. They are. They right. have to. Exactly. Right. So that's the, the, the big the stack of videos right. that I mentioned earlier that they released last Friday night. Like, that's their version of this. Right. You know, I mean, but for politics, you really only have to build one exchange, right? I mean, it's you don't actually have to have multiple exchanges. Now, it's beneficial for us because of where we want to go to build an exchange. And we wouldn't we wouldn't want to just have the federal exchange. That's why we made that decision, right? But um, to the extent that there are whole sets of Lego blocks in the federal exchange that we can just you know call on as mm -hmm. services and utilize. You bet we're going to do that, and that is how that and the fact that we actually have a little tiny exchange operating right now for Catamount Health, and we actually do in a really um, small way what the exchange calls for, which is actually let people enroll, on, select plans, enroll, make payments online, and we we have an interface between the state infrastructure and MVP and Blue Cross. You know, worst case scenario, we'll kludge that into working for 2013. But that's like plan Z of the, you know, we have lots of better paths that we would take before having to do that. But that's why I say, yeah, we'll, we'll have it. So if we don't have it done, there is a plan B? There's plan B, there's plan C, there's plan D, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so are you gonna present those to us as part of all of this, or? Yeah, you've got a lot of risk mitigation stuff in here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it so, I mean, I just, I just gave you part of it, right? right. I mean, and then some of that's described in here, but <coughs> it will certainly be more fully articulated in the overall plan. But of course, by the time that plan is written, we'll, <laughs> it's, we're going to be moving down the road. I mean, this is kind of the funny, the, the funny thing about it. Where are we in, let, let, let's compare, let, let's, what about Massachusetts and, you know, having been, you know, in this uh, process now for four and a half years, how, how, are, how far ahead are we than Massachusetts when they decided to go to universally accessible health care and a single exchange and all that? Do you have any, uh, I, so, mean, I don't know if you know, but well, it's, uh, it, I, 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 I know some because of working through this Nessie's yeah. grant and stuff. The, so they, they're actually doing work in, in, in many ways we're in kind of the same place because although they have a functioning exchange currently, yeah. they made a decision to basically, because they put that original one up in 90 days, and they're like, let's fix that. Let's right. um, go back it's and not do ideal. that again. It's, it's not, yeah, it's, it's a suboptimal thing. So they also, just like us, and actually slightly worse than us, um, have uh, almost 30 year old eligibility systems. And I say worse, worse than us, because they actually have two one for healthcare and one for everything else. But they're, they're kind of merged, but not totally. And so they're just like us, building new exchange infrastructure, although they'll reuse a bunch of what they have with the connector. They won't totally scrap it. Um, and they're building new eligibility systems. Um, and they'll reuse some of what they have. And, and just as I was describing before with our access system, you know, some things will move you know, quickly, some not as quickly. We, um, uh, so, we're we're it's tough to tough to it is it's to, yeah we're well and there's their exchange is much more of an uh, add-on to the market yeah so, so market it's based, yeah. it's in some ways more similar to what we have for Catamount right. where it's a it's a fairly small piece of the action and in large part what it did was <coughs> capture people who were Medicaid eligible but it doesn't have the functionality of actually signing those people up. If you get to a certain screen in their hand it off in their it. website, and you're below a certain income level, it says "Call Medicaid." So, right. so uh, they're they're fixing that now, and so yeah, I mean, and it's it's actually it's the same thing for us. We have you know, uh, you get a certain point in the Medicaid uh, and the the, the camera, you know, gear yeah, website. Right. You know, you got to go to Medicaid, go to mm -hmm. uh, My Benefits Vermont, and which is. Um, not what the future 
<laughs> portal work. will look like. Um, so, just think of there's the um, on page seven. There's this kind of funny matrix. Uh, uh, this is actually not an exhaustive list of the project areas. I think it's an exhaustive list of the, the funding sources. Although even within them, like in the second column, third column, the CMS MMIS, we actually have multiple MMIS sources. IPDs operating simultaneously. So um, since we were in the area um, for the gate review on Tuesday, we went up to Baltimore and met with uh, a number of CMS staff people, including um, very senior people, uh, Julie Vaughn, who um, works directly for Cindy Mann, um, and uh, a number of, uh, so leadership and people more deep in the bowels to talk about cost allocation because this is a whole other area where the administrative overhead and burden and the opportunity to slow things down tremendously is you know, a real danger to this project. Um, because each one of our, our pieces, Lego pieces and parts, is connected to an IAPD or to the establishment grant and there's lots of paperwork that goes along with that. So what we requested and what they are uh, actually were enthusiastic about us uh, beta testing is a consolidated APD reporting structure so that we'll have sort of one master document and lots of other, other pieces. And it was a, it's a, a perfect illustration of what I was saying before about the different relationship with CMS. I mean, they didn't like standing up at the whiteboard and say, well, maybe we could do it this way. And you know, drawing, like it was a vi very, it was great. So, um, and we're, uh, uh, Kate Jones from our business office was there uh, with me. She's, a, you know, there's so many great, I used to like complain before about uh, the person with the eight days isn't enough, but there are so many people working so hard on this who are doing just an unbelievable job. And I just should make you all, <laughs> make, mm -hmm. doesn't get said often enough. Kate was, uh, um, it was great to have her there because she's the one like at the Diva business office who's on the receiving end of all of that stuff. So to have her bring her perspective to the mothership there at CMS and be able to interact and say, yeah, that wouldn't really be that helpful, but oh, well, we could do this. So it was a really, it was a really good um, process. So I don't. Do you, um, you know, you've got that grand scheme of how it all fits together and it is really, it makes it under, um, almost understandable for people like me and you've got like, where the money comes from somewhere that have you ever tried to take on a kind of a benchmarking calendar of not little things but big things by this date we'll have this capacity by this date we'll have this capacity by that date we'll have this that's, that's part of what I'm going to show you when I come back next week okay is, Great. Um, and it's and it's actually Go, it spans all the way to the kinds of things that you yeah. so it's like the purple part of my drawing which is all the integrated core services to you know after the EHRs and the VHI and, and all those pieces and sort of where how that lines up actually it goes out to 2020 <laughs> so uh, um, and does anybody in Vermont have a what I'd call a reasonably close working relationship with Cindy Mann directly you have okay, yeah. and and she she makes herself available to yeah no directors. I yeah. mean, the Mark has met with her now, and okay. I mean, Susan's certainly used to meet with her. A lot, yeah, so. so I mean, there's enough relationship if we ever had to call yeah. on her. Oh yeah, absolutely. No, we have a yeah. we have a very good. Um, I, I was a little surprised to hear um, Jim Hester say that he felt like we didn't have as much visibility at CMS as the. Um, I mean, we had we had a pretty high between Craig, me, and. Okay. Yeah, no, Cindy's on the Medicaid side. Right. I think in general, you know, Medicaid has a history of working with states to a much greater degree than Medicare, and um, their current attitude about working with states is very positive. For the Medicare side, uh, they've never done anything directly right. with states, and and so for for example, we're going to talk with CMMI on Monday about payment reform. In reality, all of their payment reform, the nexus with the state is providers. States don't 
actually go and say, can we do right. this with Medicare? Providers go and say, mm -hmm. it. so it's it's just a totally different mindset, which yeah. they're trying to I think Address. change and yeah. improve, but uh, the the culture and mindset is very different than Medicaid. Right, right. I think it's a there's a, a there is a real um, shift within CMS because because of having Sasaya there, and uh, and CMMI and the Office of the Duals, there's a lot more state-facing, you know, focus than there's ever been in the past. Um, but I agree, I think that, that there's still a long way to go on the Medicare side. Um, although, I mean, you know, we, we were, I mean, the, the, what Craig was able to do with the establishing the MAPCP demo was, you know, the first time since the Maryland, you know, uh, rate setting, that they were willing to do something multi-payer and coming, fr coming from states, not from inside themselves. So I think it's a, um, but there, the, the other thing that I, it's actually um, worth noting is that there are people within CMS, um, Jess Kahn is a real leader in this regard. Um, she's in charge of the, everything that falls under the state Medicaid HIT plan stuff, so the incentive program and working with the state HIEs, et cetera. And she actually took it upon herself to create an internal work group focused on what CMS can get from state HIEs and from state um, uh, health reform and how that and what's going on at the state level can make things at CMS easier. So instead of like, for instance, the way that the, the, the QIO structure is very odd and sort of off on its own and has portals for reporting information in which you never really get anything back. You know, two years later, you get a not particularly significant check um, and not really any, there's no feedback loop. And so the idea of actually having um, an infrastructure that provides quality metrics and along with the payment information. Um, it's very appealing to them. Jess has really been driving that and, and Julie Vaughn um, last week when we met was talking about, um, I, I, uh, cheering her on on this idea of really getting uh, kind of a minimum data set of quality metrics that would be expected across all of their programs and would that would tie to the EHR instead of program and the, the minimum standards um, for the EHR. So I think there are a lot there are a lot of people who are understanding that we're not going to have the kind of data liquidity that we envision if we don't standardize and simplify. Parsimony being a, like a really good word in this realm in terms of you know focus. Focus exactly. So any other questions for him? Oh, just an observation. You. I mean, this is a science, but it's also an art. And I, I can't think of too many people, if any, that could pull it together the way you are. It's very, very, very difficult. And so important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hunter. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's rewarding. You know, it's like, like, I mean, I guess I'm a nerd, but like, how cool <laughs> is this? Like, this is about <laughs> the most possible, you know, I mean, if we, we achieve data liquidity, like, right. that will be really important. It's like yes, Nirvana. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's like Nirvana, but it's, yeah, it's like it health reform be. design, though. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, like, we want, we want, and we're, how are we ever going to, I just think about, like, you know, having actual hospital budget data, not, like, <laughs> rolled up, I don't know, I think of discussions we've had in this room about the, the what's beneath the information that you are able to get. That's not, it's not granular, it's, you know, you don't, it's the only industry in the world that we don't actually have the data required to manage effectively, you know, so there's the- It's the only industry in the world that we do not know what the cost of a unit of service truly is. That would be true, that would be true. I almost forgot, public comment, Walter or Johan, I think you're the only. <laughs> You're the only public. You're our public today. Say what? I'm the public today. Yeah, you are representing the citizens okay. of Vermont. Yeah. Any questions or comments? Um, as I was listening to Hannah, I just said, I don't know, just one thing for the future. <laughs> now I'll get stage fright. <laughs> 
Um, <coughs> how easy will this be for computer illiterates to understand? They're going on to the exchanges. Well, that's why um, it has to. Uh, <laughs> here, wait a minute. No, 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 um, the design firm IDEO, um, which has done a bunch of work with Apple and their like Google IDEO, so they've done lots of really cool stuff. Anyway, they're uh, working on the um, user interface for the web portal, and and then also uh, to have it extend out to phones and mm -hmm. um, you know all kinds of different uh, uh, things and, and to print material and, and part of their approach has been very grounded in how do we do this so that it's accessible to everybody and mm -hmm. not uh, you know, just for the computer elite and, uh, and elite area. So it's, it's, it's very much in our forethought. And Lindsay Tucker, the new um, deputy commissioner of the exchange, is very focused on that. I just, I had that question. I'm back to work in the kitchen of all places again, which I like. And I had a person ask me that. I'm a computer illiterate. How am I going to figure out these exchanges? He barely knew how to turn them on. Well, so. Telephone. Yeah. Or, or the yeah. navigators. I mean, that's their role also. Or you give your phone to your 10 year old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Could you please sign me up for insurance? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would probably work, actually. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Oh, Thomas, I'm sorry, you, you were also and, and, and Wait, well, back up a little. You're not on camera very well. Okay, yeah. I, I, I wanted to... Uh, Look at Alec go. go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, gotcha. He's not just a doc, man. That guy can do anything. I, I had to get this thing in my hand and, and actually use it. But I'd like to make an announcement <coughs> that Tuesday's thing is on YouTube now. Wow. And, and Tomorrow morning, I will get the link up on, on the Camo VT site so that you can link into it with all the other documents that are currently available. Right. And if I'm and I'm shooting to be able to have put it up the same night, I'm not going to do it tonight because I got to put meetings to tonight. So anyway, when and, you um, when you have the link, will you make sure that you send it to to either me or it, Janet so that yeah, she everybody has it? Camo VT dot org, C A M A V T dot O R G, and and I'm posting. It's a blog, so I'm posting one at a time. Eventually, when I get some more help, I want to create a page with a with a with a table of contents, and you can link any any meeting, and hopefully the meeting will have the, the the video, the agenda, the powerpoints, any handouts, any other documents, all in one page, so you you can you can follow you along. Are you paying him under the table? Yeah, like, remember the is that the bouncing ball on the TV? Is it singing along? Is it bouncing along? Coming along? Thank you, Thomas. Okay. That's great. State transparency. <laughs> and I, 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 but we need, I need more technical support to know how to do video post-production. Uh, talk I, to I, my 10-year-old. <laughs> that 10-year-old. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, actually talking to a, 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 a student who wants to look for an internship who, who is a video freak. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's and, the way to go. And he happens to know some people on the staff here, so it's, I got a connection there. Okay, too. good. Thanks, Tom. Right. Keep us posted. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Thanks. Mm -hmm.